good evening. Welcome everyone to the Institute of Historical Research and the Marxism and Culture Seminar. My name is Chrissy Papayano. I'm one of the seminar conveners here and it gives me great pleasure to introduce um, tonight's speaker, Nat Raha. Some of you will be familiar with Nat's work because she's a very active activist, but also a poet who has performed her work in a number of venues, including Senate House recently as part of the Radical Voices exhibition, um, organized by Senate House Library, and also she has published her work in a number of collections and pamphlets, and I should mention here the most, the most recent one called Extinctions, but which is in fact typed with the euro sign and the pound sign and the forward slash and they're connected and bound, um, because as Nad describes the pamphlet in her blog, it's a zine pamphlet of pre-Brexit prophecy and disintegrations. Um, and her broader, <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about that more later. Her broader body of work, and you can correct me here if, if I'm representing you wrongly, can be situated uh, at the intersection of poetics, queer studies, trans studies, and critical race theory. And she has been involved in organising platforms such as the Race and Poetry and Poetics in the UK, and a stream at the London Conference in Critical Thought called Radical Transfeminism. Her main project is her doctoral dissertation. Um, entitled Queer Capital, Marxism and Queer Theory and Post-1950 Poetics, which she's writing at the University of Sussex under the supervision of Keston Sutherland. And... Um, <laughs> is that correct? Yes. Just about. Supervision is always a, you know, a loose thing. Um, and uh, <laughs> and uh, Nat has recently... <laughs> <laughs> Nat has recently moved to Scotland and now she's involved uh, with a research project at the Edinburgh College of Art called Cruising the 1970s, Unearthing Pre-HIV AIDS Queer Sexual Cultures. And I should also mention the fact that Nat will have her first scholarly publication out at South Atlantic, with South Atlantic Quarterly, which will be out this summer in 2017, this summer and the article is called Transfeminine Brokenness, Radical Transfeminism. So we look forward to reading that. Um, so tonight's paper, the focus will be on an expanded definition of the category of social reproduction, which has <coughs> primarily been used in Marxist feminist theories through the prism of domestic labor or domestic mode of production. And um, I think that this intervention is really, really timely and pushes debates forward in many different directions, both from a queer studies perspective and what's usually a deconstructive psychoanalytic dominance in queer studies, but also for, for us in the, in the Marxist context. So we'd like to have Nat. Please welcome Nat. Uh, thanks, Chrissy, for having me, and thanks to the uh, MIC team. It's really nice to be here. It's quite exciting, actually. And this has kind of been in the works for a while, both this... this talk and also the work that I'm talking about. Um, I'm going to give a very quick, very quick uh, location of this work. Um, so as you've all just heard about my PhD, this is a, uh, currently being turned into a PhD chapter, so it's in this kind of strange hybrid moment, which will sit up in the middle of the talk, um, which in the middle of the talk I'm going to talk a bit about street transvestite action revolutionaries who are a group based in New York in the 70s. Um, the bit of that talk is actually from a different paper that I've kind of slotted in here, so if it feels like it's slightly less synthesised, that's maybe the reason for it. Um, there's something else I was going to say. Uh, there might be some random points in the talk where I realise a word is missing from the sentence I'm reading, so I'll hopefully, hopefully that'll be okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so the talk is entitled uh, Queering Marxist Transfeminism, Queer and Trans Social Reproduction. So... In the now canonical uh, in queer studies, uh, tw The Twilight of Equality, Lisa Duggan's formulation of homonormativity as, quote, a politics that does not uh, contest dominant heteronormative assumptions and institutions, but upholds and sustains them, end quote, emerges with, within conditions of possibility backed by neoliberal capitalist structural adjustment and its transformations of the conditions of socially reproductive labour. Homonormativity is offered specifically with, it, with a, quote, promise of a demobilised gay constituency and a privatised, depoliticised gay culture anchored in domesticity and consumption, end quote. 
Duggan emphasizes that neoliberal capitalist structural, uh, social restructuring privatizes the costs in labor of social reproduction through a disinvestment in social security. Next to the facilitation of an upward redistribution of wealth and for the public financing of businesses, uh, such disinvestment takes the, form, uh, takes the form of austerity measures, including uh, to the cuts in social services and welfare provisions that we've become really familiar with in the UK over the, this decade. Um, Duggan emphasizes that this occurs alongside the political rhetoric that caring labor, including supporting disabled persons, childcare, and adult social care, is a personal responsibility of families, rather than that of the state. With this disinvestment, the costs of socially reproductive labour, both financial and of socially necessary labour time, are left to individual families and households to pick up the fiscal slack. Duggan clearly intends for us to, get, to consider this material context, undergirding her polemical message that, quote, we get marriage in the military, then we go home and cook dinner forever, end quote. While Duggan considers the privatisation of caring labour through state recognition of gay marriage as the, the form of queer, relation, queer relationality par excellence, her comments, and her comments are suggestive that the privatisation of such labour are indeed the conditions of possibility for privatised state-sanctioned gay marriage, she refrains from developing an analysis of the modes of caring labour undertaken within and to sustain queer relational modes. So while arguments that gay marriage uh, reassures a key institution of capitalist society are numerous, a theorization of the caring, labor, the caring domestic and emotional labor we undertake to ensure our continuing existence as queer and trans subjects and the historical transformation of the material conditions surrounding such labor within the context of neoliberal capitalism and the ascendancy of gay marriage uh, as the legally recognized form of, of same-sex kinship uh, is yet to be broached in queer or trans studies. Such theorization must consider our contemporary moment, where the, daily, where the daily lives of many LGBTQ people are marked by precarious, precarious work, both waged and unwaged, precarious housing, precarious healthcare, and precarious immigration status. Furthermore, despite the recent uh, resurgence of social reproduction theory and Marxist feminism, uh, the social reproduction of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer lives remains under-theorized in this context. I should probably say that I'm not going to go into huge detail about this, the Marxist feminist formula formulation of social reproduction uh, because I'm, I'm kind of assuming you'll have some idea of it and there's, you know, there's plenty of books out there to go and look at. Um, but in brief, uh, social reproduction... <laughs> in really, really brief, it's really two sentences. Uh, social reproduction, uh, to quote Barbara Lesser and Johanna Brenner, um, describes uh, the activities and attitudes, behaviours and emotions responsibilities and relationships directly involved in the maintenance of life on a daily basis, end quote. Marxist feminism conceptualizes socially reproductive labor as the work that reproduces workers and their labor power and capitalism, the latter of which is exchanged directly or either directly or indirectly um, with capitalist employees for wages. Um, in Western capitalist society, this work has historically uh, taken place within the <coughs> domestic sphere of the nuclear heteronormative family, undertaken by women and or migrant women of colour. As the work of uh, Sylvia Federici and Sarah Farris shows, among others, the gendered, racialized division of labour within white, patriarchal capitalist society reproduces the feminized and racialized character of this work across the supposed divide of the global north and the global south where women and feminized workers from the global south, that is, workers of color, are often responsible for the social reproduction of bodies in or from the global north. So while heterosexuality as a form of work has long been considered as part of Marxist feminism's analysis, the consideration of queer sexualities has been sidelined in the canon of Marxist feminism. Um, next to some brief remarks on queer sexualities by Silvia Federici and Kathy Weeks, uh, is the political demands and practice of wages due lesbians, an international group who are part of the uh, wages for housework movement, and furthermore, uh, the arguments and praxis of the gay liberation movement um, for the abolition of the nuclear family, for gay communalism and interdependency. There are also the struggles of LGBTQI parents today, say for child custody, and the broader uh, challenges for re and broader challenges for reproductive justice. Uh, including issues such as access to abortions, for, uh, fertility treatment for and, the, and challenging the forced sterilization of trans people of various genders, 
and the, re- and the recognition of queer and trans family forms in excess of the monogamous nuclear family. Such challenges um, oppose the virulent homophobia, transphobia, whorephobia, ableism and racism that has been deployed to shore up the boundaries of the nuclear family across the 20th century and that find new articulations in the current neo-fascist period. Indeed, the reproduction of the lives of sexual and gender deviance against the familial norms of capitalist society raises questions around the valuation of our lives by capital itself, which must be considered next to our assertion as LGBT rights-bearing subjects into systems of wage labour. I've um, written about that a bit elsewhere. So, this paper, <coughs> if I can get to it, um, will argue uh, queer and trans world-making, political work, struggle and survival uh, have, so as this paper will argue, um, queer and trans world-making, political struggle and survival um, have depended upon practices of socially reproductive labour oriented towards queer and trans bodies. This in turn necessitates an expansion of the concept of socially reproductive labour. To argue that our lives as LGBTQ persons inhabiting varied familial and community formations um, within a queer and trans socius affected by by our material, cultural, social and legal positions within capitalist society is to give socially reproductive labour a different orientation to the reproduction of labour power in a Marxist sense for capital's consumption. If our labour power has been historically devalued by capital, as queers, women, people of colour, <coughs> migrant workers, trans people, disabled people, uh, wo- um, sex workers, working within a racialised and gender division of labour, uh, such a conception decenters capital's demand for the labour power we carry within us. Yet this conception must maintain an eye on capital's incorporation and transformation of such bodies and the position of such bodies in the labour market and capitalist society. Homonormativity and Jasper Poirot's concept of homonationalism could be argued as synonyms for the varied incorporations of such bodies into national labour markets with respect to, the, to a gendered and racialized division of labour. So um, this paper is going to first consider work within queer Marxism and trans studies that's begin to address socially reproductive labour from a queer perspective. I'm then going to consider some work from black feminism and then in more detail LGBTQ activism uh, that's been sidelined within this canon of socially reproductive theory and Marxist feminism, um, building upon this to provide a broader conceptualization of trans and queer social reproduction. <clears throat> okay. So queering social reproduction. Queer Marxism, trans studies, and queer studies have more broadly made suggestions towards forms, uh, uh, and queer studies more broadly, have made suggestions towards forms of socially reproductive labour that reproduce queer and trans lives, workers, and worlds. Miranda Joseph and Meg Westling have varyingly argued that the concept of socially, of socially reproductive labour must be expanded to include the work that enables queer and trans subjectivities and lives. Uh, work such as non, non-procreative sex, public sex, and the activities that give pleasure, satisfy, and enable the expression of queer and trans bodies. Meg Westling and Jane Ward's work um, has emphasised the labour of gender itself. Uh, Jane Ward in particular considered, well, so Meg Weston considers the collectivised production of feminine gender expression of a group of transformistas in the 1990s in Cuba, and uh, Ward considers the emotional labour undertaken by femmes to support and affirm the masculinity of trans men respectively. I'm going to talk about that in more detail. Um, in addition, Alan Sears' recent work emphasises the construction of sexuality itself through socially reproductive labour. And furthermore, Robert McGrewer's hi- work has highlighted uh, the relations of exploitation that sustain the able-bodied, heteronormative nuclear family in relation to queer, crip, and feminist familial formations. Addressing the relation of gender to pro- certain productive practices, uh, Miranda Joseph suggests that, quote, if child socialization or heterosexual sexual activity <coughs> can be recognized by materialist feminist arguments as valuable labor, then gay sex is also certainly analyzable as a valuable productive act productive of relations, identities, communities, and social spaces, end quote. Joseph points towards the role of anonymous gay public sex as a form of reproductive activity, enabling gay identities and defining pub- public gay communal space, such as cruising grounds and parks, bar- bathhouses, and also bars. Um, however, work, uh, Joseph's otherwise uh, excellent work on the supplementary relation of capital and communities, this is in her book, uh, Against the Romance of Community, uh, refrains from developing this analysis. 
Such activity undoubtedly enables queer social relations. The criminalization, say, of public sex attempts to stop such behavior if deemed to have a negative effect on, uh, to an area by, say, a state, thus criminalizing queer social formations in public space and criminalizing queer reproductive activity. Uh, as with the case of New York City's zoning laws uh, in the 1990s and 2000s, um, which were introduced by uh, Rudy Giuliani, who's now like a key person in the Trump administration, uh, the impact of such laws are often felt most by queer and trans of colour youth who may also be homeless. In her essay on queer value, uh, Meg Westman highlights the importance of the, quote, myriad forms of social activity that go beyond subsistence and reproduction. Those activities that work towards the aims of the body's comfort, uh, towards the aims of the body's comforts, pleasures, and the satisfaction of desire that we would want to acknowledge as labour, end quote. Uh, Westling read, uh, Westling's reading of the 1996 Cuban film Mariposas en Aldamio, which is Butterflies on the Scaffold, highlights the labour of a group of transformistas in post-revolutionary post Cuba to produce and perform their feminine gender expressions from limited materials. Westling's reading of the film emphasises the, the quote-unquote social utility of drag, and the labour production and performance of feminine gender expressions as pleasurable and, quote, important cultural work, end quote, where the situation of gender is importantly understood through the particular social, national, and historically specific context of post-revolutionary Cuba. Wesling argues that the successes of the Transformistas' performances, these are drag queens doing performances to construction workers on their lunch breaks, um, provide both, quote, a vision of gender as the self-conscious production of human work, end quote, and through this, quote, integrates the, uh, integrate the politics of sexual transgression to the aspirations of a utopian anti-capitalist revolutionary project, end quote. Um, in her essay, Considering the Collective Work of Gender Transgression Between Trans Men and Queer Femmes, Jane Ward emphasises the minimal attention that's been paid uh, to the intimate and caring labour which produces transgender worlds, homes and lives within trans studies. Focusing on such labour... Uh, Wood defines the term gender labour. Uh, this is a quote given her description. To describe the effective and bodily efforts invested in giving gender to others, or actively suspending self-focus in service of helping others achieve the varied forms of gender recognition they long for. Gender labour is the work of bolstering someone else's gender authenticity, but it's also the work of co-producing someone's gender irony, transgression or exceptionality. End quote. In this formulation, gender labour is undertaken to support another's gender expression and reflect its validity and the qualities of its performance in the world. Ward describes such labour as, constituting, uh, as constituent, constituating, con constituting, what's the word? Ward describes such labour as constituting of both the effective labours that, quote, keeps genders in motion, end quote, alongside the, quote, physical and feminised labours that contribute to the production of queer and normative genders e.g. cooking, sexual services, nursing care, administering gender technology slash hormones, chess binding, end quote. Describing the, labor, the gender labour that produces various expressions of masculinity and femininity, she emphasises that while, quote, these efforts are often labours of love enacted for and um, by people who are denied gender validation within mainstream culture, uh, in brackets, women, men of colour and queers, end quote, such work, quote, quote, must not elide the ways in which gender is reproduced through routinized forms of care work, end quote. Ward's study, undertaken on the west coast of the USA in 2004, uh, specifically considers the intimate labour undertaken by queer femmes, who are the subjects of her interviews, to bolster the masculine subjectivity of trans men, who are specifically defined as FTM in the study, uh, to bolster the masculinity of trans male sexual partners. Um, the orientation of the study allows her to emphasise how, quote, some genders, principally those that are masculine and especially those that intersect with other forms of power, such as wealth and whiteness, make their demands less visible and more legitimate, or deliver them with more coercive, coercive force, end quote. Arguing that, quote, all genders demand work and therefore all people give, both give and require gender labour, end quote, 
She emphasizes that, quote, gender labor, like other forms of caring, weighs down most heavily on feminine subjects, mm. the people for whom labors of love are naturalized, expected, or forced, end quote. So while, um, while Ward's formulation of gender labor is significant and clear, uh, there is basically this big question of trans agency in her in the orientation of her analysis. As, this, as her interview subjects are queer femmes, describing the labor they undertake to bolster the masculinity of their trans male partners, trans subjects are not considered as agents undertaking gender labor within the analysis, even if by the terms of the analysis they would undertake such labor. If gender labor is indeed part of the collective production of transgression, in Ward's essay it remains elucidated as work done by non-trans feminine subjects for trans masculine people. While her argument that the production of queerness um, falls more heavily on feminine subjects, uh, alongside her argument that queer theories embrace of modes of life that are, quote, made most possible or necessary for masculine subjects, end quote, Wood's essay unfortunately reproduces the evacuation of agency from trans subjects that is often witnessed within medical professions, legal bureaucracy, the state, and arguably queer theory itself. Furthermore, the orientation of the analysis entails a complete erasure of trans feminine bodies and the labor of trans femininity um, from Ward's conception of gender labor. <coughs> so if we place this next to this, uh, the analysis of queer value produced by the transformistas as formulated by Meg Westlane, who collectively produce their feminine gender expressions from limited, reappropriated materials due to a scarcity of cosmetics and material resources in Cuba, it could be argued that trans-feminine subjects in or from the global south often find themselves at the bottom of a hierarchical international division of gender labor, innovating their genders out of this material necessity. Furthermore, um, Robert McGraw's work historicizes the development of the domestic family and the space of the home in the 20th century as able-bodied space intersecting with ideologies of domesticity and the family, which can and does relegate disabled people within the hierarchies of social and domestic life. McCrua argues for the importance of recognizing and enacting crypt domesticities and their possibilities, which productively intersect with queer domestic relationships. McCrua highlights interdependent queer feminist and crypt community formations that enable, the, that enable the support, sustenance, sustenance and nourishment of queer and disabled feminists, particularly in the cases where queer and or disabled people's relationships are erased and hindered uh, by legal, medical and social institutions, such as hospitals, nursing homes and religious institutions. In his reading of Why Can't Sharon Kowalski Come Home, McCrea argues that, quote, the feminist, queer, and disabled relations of interdependency that co-author Karen Thompson uh, encounters expose the inadequacy of the able-bodied heterosexual family, end quote, elucidating structural fictions between the private family and the public sphere, which respectively support, quote, heterosexual and able-bodied intimacy and security, end quote, and sustain and, quote, sustain relations of exploitation by privileging ideologies of independence and protecting heterosexual and able-bodied identities and homes, end quote. Such structural fictions and ideologies are crucial for upholding the racialized and gender division of labor within structuring the heteronormative able-bodied nuclear family that devalues disabled and or LGBTQ persons' lives. So between these readings, we've got an emphasis on uh, the public character of queer sexuality and its role in defining get, um, its role in defining queer communal spaces, a vision of the collective production of gender and feminine gender expressions, uh, a concept of the effective and concrete work of gender labor, and a conception of cryptomesticity that uh, produced through queer feminist and disability activist communities that emphasizes the interdependent communal character of supporting the conditions and politics that make queer feminist and disabled lives more livable. So I'm going to turn to talk a bit about black feminist perspectives on socially reproductive work. Um, before a detailed consideration of LGBTQ activist work that has developed the politics of social reproduction through praxis, it's necessary to consider contributions made by black feminism uh, to the formulation of socially reproductive labour. Orienting analysis of domestic labour around black women, as Patricia Hill Collins' work shows, provides a significant shift in standpoint towards the role of socially reproductive labour from that advanced by Marxist feminism. 
Hill Collins argues that black feminist scholarship, quote, suggests that black women see their unpaid domestic work more as a form of resistance to oppression than as a form of exploitation by men, end quote. And that such work, quote, remains a fundamental location where the dialectical relationship of oppression and activism occurs, end quote. Furthermore, Hill Collins emphasizes that the, di- emphasizes that, uh, the dichotomy of public and private spheres equating male economic provision with the workplace and female effective provision with domestic space holds neither for African Americans whose families, quote, exhibit fluid public slash private boundaries because of racial because racial oppression has impoverished disproportionate numbers of black families, end quote, or for poor families who do not necessarily quote equate private with home and public with work, end quote. Ada Hurtado and uh, Chandra Talpe Mahanti also emphasise that, quote, the economic conditions that underlie this public-private distinction, end quote, have not benefited women, women of colour. Indeed, the interdependent black lesbian domestic space as a site of resistance through nurturing is the space that frames Audre Lorde's work. In, uh, in her essay, The Master's Tools Will Never Dismantle the Master's House, Lord writes that, quote, for women, the desire and need to nurture each other is not, pathologi- not pathological, but redemptive, end quote. And with this knowledge comes power. She states that, quote, interdependency between women is the way to a freedom which allows the I to be, not in order to be used, but in order to be creative. This is the difference between the passive be and the active being, end quote. The queer of colour domestic space and the understanding that comes through the desire which forms it, is for Lord a potent site of knowledge and praxis for resistance through survival and loving and caring labour more broadly. This is knowledge in and through the desires that are often in excess to the prescriptions of the nuclear family under capitalism, in a politicised excess of both the insertions into systems of wage labour of the bodies reproduced within the nuclear family, and of what uh, Lisa Duggan describes as the quote-unquote political sedative of the, f- of the forms of gay marriage which neoliberal states and queer and trans political, uh, queer and trans liberal political endeavours would like us to adopt. Okay, so I'm going to talk a bit more about activism. Um, LGBTQ activist practice centering social reproduction and specifically uh, the work of street transvestite action revolutionaries. It's worth noting, uh, next to the slow pace of theoretical developments to account for the effective labour surrounding queer and trans social formations, as I've just outlined above, um, a politicised understanding of the work, of the work, the work, I put work and labour, a politicised understanding of the, of the work enabling such formations, worlds and expressions, and the necessity to collectivise such work, has long since been a part of queer and trans activist praxis, especially... Uh, of the practice of trans and queer people of colour. Turning our attention to the queer and trans political practice of the, from, from the 1970s, uh, alongside critiques made by the women's movement, a critique <coughs> of the quote-unquote bourgeois nuclear family, end quote, as a site of the production of heteronormative and racialized gender conformity was also advanced by the gay liberation movement. Uh, Third World Gay Revolution, who formed in New York, USA in the summer of 1970, argued that the family was a central site for the perpetuation of heterosexist and homophobic sex roles and sexist and cissexist sex definition, whereby mothers and fathers are instrumental in teaching and enforcing the gendered, quote, behaviour necessary in a capitalist system, end quote. The collectivization of socially reproductive labour uh, through the formations of communes were common within the movement. One such example would be the work of Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries, or STAR, uh, the radical third world and black gay slash trans liberation group founded by Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera in New York in the autumn of 1970, uh, who combined caring labour, sex work, prison solidarity and political activism to care for homeless, gay and trans of colour youth. By situating and rereading the political labour undertaken by STAR within the intersection of gay and lesbian liberation and the Latinx and black liberation movements of their time, struggles that uh, marginalised and welcomed STARS members in regards to their deviance from racial, class, gender and sexual norms. 
Star's work may be read today as a transfeminism of colour centred around prison support, sex work and the collectivisation of and collectivised forms of caring labour. While Star emerged directly out of the gay liberation movement, the group and its members were visible and active in contemporaneous Latinx and black movements, most specifically Puerto Rican revolutionary organisation The Young Lords. And their work took forms similar to that of these movements. As a group, STAR were primarily constituted, and work, uh, constituted by and working for the needs of black and Latinx street queens and homeless gay youth. That is, uh, they were constituted by and providing support for those marginalised within the wider, predominantly white and middle class gay liberation movement and white American capitalist society. Furthermore, in supporting the survival of poor, feminised and gender deviant people of colour, Star's work provides an important contribution to third world feminism and its histories, as work that, in uh, Mahanti's words, enabled, quote, the day-to-day -day strategies of survival utilised by people of colour and post-colonial peoples, end quote. Such political practice remains profoundly important today for trans and queer politics, and highlights a need to centre the struggles of racially and or economically marginalised trans people. So while Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson occupy significant positions in transgender history, and the transpolitical imaginary. Their canonization has often erased their, erased their positions as people, people of color, street queens, which is a term they use as self-descriptors, which denotes a, like a class position of living and working uh, that is selling sex on the street. Um, and the political practices that emerge from such positions, I think of, uh, this, is, this is a really long sentence. <laughs> as Jesse Gann em importantly emphasizes in the case of Sylvia Rivera, uh, Sylvia's visibility and reclamation by trans activists as, quote, transgender stonewall combatant has concealed the subjectivity, uh, concealed her subjectivity as a working class Puerto Rican slash Venezuelan drag queen, end quote. In addition, the revolutionary politics of STAR is often represented as the, that of simply campaigning for transgender rights. However, STAR's activism was part of, uh, activism for rights was part of their struggle for survival and the revolutionary transformation of society by and for people of colour. So it must be emphasised then that Star were <coughs> primarily a group of poor Latina and black street queens. In Sylvia's words, quote, a majority of the queens were Latin, end quote. During up to 30 people to their meetings, Star mixed uh, politics of transgender expression, pursuing radical civil rights for poor and or homeless trans and gay people with prison activism and support uh, the agency of street people and the revolutionary rhetoric of the black power and third world liberation movements. Uh, in another version of this, uh, there's some quotes that make Marsha sound like she's one of the Black Panthers, and they're really awesome. Um, Star's political platform developed the gay liberation movement's critique, uh, radical critique, of white middle class male dominated heterosexual societies, repressive and murderous sexism, where sexism was understood as the root of gender oppression and the oppression of homosexuality. Star's activism included sheltering and supporting street queens and homeless gays and lesbians. At, uh, activity within the wider gay liberation movement included participating in demonstrations, uh, including uh, marches on the State House in Albany, New York, uh, which if you saw the Facebook page for this event, there's a photo of Marjorie Johnson at one of those demonstrations. Um, demonstrations in support of uh, New York Gay and Lesbian Rights Ordinance, intro 475 uh, in 1970 and 1971, protest outside St. Patrick's Cathedral, and the Christopher Street Liberation Day Parade, which is now Gay Pride in New York. Activity also included partaking in occupations, invention, interventions and zaps of politicians, uh, and playing a key role in the collective running of the Gay Liberation Front's affiliated Gay Community Centre, uh, and organising dances to fundraise for STAR. STAR also attended demonstrations led by the Young Lords and Black Panthers, and alongside Third World Gay Revolution and the Gay Liberation Front were, quote, active in the support, end quote, of <coughs> Communist Party member Angela Davis, in spite of uh, the Communist Party's dismissal of their support. Having previously supported street queens and homeless gay youth by sheltering them in hotel rooms and in the back of a trailer, uh, the group established Star House. Renting a building from the Mafia and paying the $200 rent through sex work, Star provided shelter, food, clothing, friends, and political solidarity, primarily for Latina street queens. Star House consisted of four rooms. They housed up to 25 street queens and homeless gays and lesbians at once. 
and the labour producing Star House as a, as a shelter um, included fixing up the building for inhabitation, which is like doing the plumbing, and producing a and the production of a politicised space adorned with free Angela Davis and free all political prisoners posters. In addition, the labour of prostitution and the money this work procured, supplemented by the maternal care work of uh, Sylvia and Marcia, directly enabled the creation of the space for the survival, support and politicisation of poor trans and gay people. In addition, um, as Susan Stryker writes, uh, Starr intended to, quote, to educate and to protect the younger people who were coming into the kind of life they themselves led, end quote. And that furthermore, Starr, quote, envisioned, setting, envision, envisioned establishing a school for kids who'd had their formal education interrupted because of discrimination or bullying, end quote. So Star House functioned with a division of labour. Um, the older group members selling sex to shield younger queens from the dangers of working on the street, while the younger queens, quote unquote, liberated food. This labour built upon the solidarity and kinship among queens working on the street. <coughs> Jessie Gann highlights that on leaving home age 10 to her new home among queens on 42nd Street, Times Square, uh, Sylvia, quote, was excited to find so many drag queens, some of whom adopted her and helped out, end quote. Gann emphasises the importance of Sylvia's, and by extension, stars, quote, visions of kinship, family and community, quote, as, quote, both inclusive and dynamic. Like her lifelong attempts at building home, they, were, they are unpredictable, impatient, but generous, provisional, yet welcoming, end quote. Located on uh, 213 East 2nd Street in Manhattan, Star House was situated in the primarily Puerto Rican working class neighborhood known to locals as Lois Saida. Sylvia recalls that Star House had a positive relationship with neighborhood. She describes Star's work as including babysitting for locals and feeding, quote, this is in Sylvia's words, half of the neighborhood because we had an abundance of food that kids liberated, quote, uh, and she emphasized that such, work, such solidarity was a, quote, unquote, revolutionary thing. Knowing the political, pleasurable space that such work created, Sylvia remarked that, quote, there was always food in the house and everyone had fun, end quote. <laughs> such forms of work, such forms of care work as activism were not uncommon in, um, in the Black Power and Third World Liberation Movements. For instance, Black Panthers had a program of free breakfast for school children, and the Young Lords undertook health care programs for the Puerto Rican community in East Harlem. Um, I guess one of the differences is, whilst these programmes were often staffed by women, and this care work had a revolutionary function, it was often conceptualised in a denigrating fashion as women's work by the men of the parties, which is, you know, this reassertion of this division of labour. So the history, work and practice of STAR sketched above provide an important example of transfeminism of colour today. Stars activism took forms uh, that are significant for the genealogy of black, queer and feminist politics of anti-violence, prison abolition and, and socially reproductive work. Stars' practice asserted that, these that the lives of street queens of colour who were sex workers were valuable, in need of support and worth protecting and nourishing through these forms of activism. A testament, for, of, a testament of acting for each other when white America and the white middle class aspects of the gay liberation movement did not recognise the importance of such lives. From the early 70s to the, to the present day, black feminist politics has affirmed and uh, would affirm and has repeatedly affirmed the, lives, the value of the lives and work of women of colour. A significant known example uh, was the response of the Compee River Collective to the deaths of 12 black women in Boston in 1979. Um, Grace Hung and Roger Ferguson, hang on, that's, that's not this. I'm missing some papers. Uh, yes. So Grace Hong and Roger Ferguson argued that the Compe River collected, pr Collective provided an analysis linking the murders uh, of, of the black women in Boston, quote, insisting that race and gender are ultimately names for the processes that ushered these women to their untimely deaths, killed because their lives were not valued and, in this way, were outright extinguished, end quote. Stiles' practice challenged such murderous processes of devaluing feminized people of color, who were poor, homeless, gender deviant, queer and or sex workers. Stiles' caring labour asserted that such lives were valuable and worth loving amid violently oppressive social and material conditions, and, the, and that their lives were more than the stigmas attached to them through racial, 
class and gender subordination, and the labour uh, such as sex work and care work that they undertake. I'm going to now talk about wages due lesbians for a little bit. And I'm wrapping up. Um, the queer perspective on Marxist feminist politics advanced by wages due lesbians remains marginal within the history of Marxist feminism and under research in both queer studies and social reproduction theory. Wages due lesbians describe themselves as, quote, an international network of women who are black slash of colour and white with and without disabilities of different ages slash backgrounds and occupations, end quote. The group are part of the International Wages for Housework campaign and the London group continues to exist today under the name of Queer Strike. Christina, as Christina Rousseau's work on the Toronto group in the 1970s discusses, wages do address the quote-unquote material impossibility uh, of lesbian visibility and the problem of low-paid, precarious and quote-unquote feminised job ghettos. Wages due also argued uh, the importance of the sexual autonomy of women when uh, they provided international solidarity to sex workers facing police crackdowns and gentrifications in San Francisco, stating that, quote, the attack which governments are organising against prostitute women everywhere in the world is an attack on every woman's right to determine whether and on what terms she will have sexual relations with men, end quote. Wages due argued for the recognition, counting of and pay for uh, to quote the introduction of a 1991 pamphlet by the London Group, which I would shake around if I haven't bought it with me. Um, this is a quote. The particular physical and emotional housework of surviving as lesbian women in a hostile and prejudiced, and prejudiced society, end quote. A three and a half page list uh, issued on Time Off Day, which was co-organised by the group on October 24th, 1986, describes the many, many facets of emotional work of being lesbian or bisexual. I'm just going to read a little bit of this list. <clears throat> Pretending to be straight to get some of a man's wage. Coping with the fear of losing children, jobs, home, respect or respectability in your community if you come out as lesbian. Coming out a continual process of working when, where, how, to whom and on what occasions. Wanting to be with women and with men and having to choose in order having to choose in order to fit some fit in somewhere. Thinking you're not a real lesbian if you have long hair and wear dresses. Undergoing family visits and recovering afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Facing deportation because you've left a man and so you have lost your right to stay in Britain, or because <coughs> your relationship isn't acknowledged as real. Challenging black separatists who say it's not black or third world to be lesbian and that being lesbian is a white slash European contamination or disease. Challenging slash coping with racism, ageism, class prejudice and disability racism sick in your relationship with others. Being silenced about violence in relationship with women because speaking out will make us all more vulnerable. Having to invent lesbian lives having to get by on low, pay, on low women's wages or poverty line benefits, having to set off for limited places to meet other lesbian women, being an unemployed lesbian working on the game and having to hide the money when people don't know how you, got, how you get it, doing emotional and physical work for lovers, friends, family, but never being acknowledged for doing it because your relationships aren't real, bringing up children in a hostile society constantly threatened with having them taken away from us because we're classed as bad or unfit mothers, fighting anti-lesbian prejudice in housing, social services, the health system, colleges, schools, employment, being told that being lesbian means liberation and wondering why you're still poor, overworked and not happy all the time. Um. The, the next two paragraphs, I think, say the same thing, but I'll hopefully not repeat myself. Uh, as we can see, wages due intimately understood the additional emotional work facing lesbian and bisexual women's lives under the duress of Margaret Thatcher's state, and how, such, how the demand of such labour as a necessity for survival of varied lesbian lives articulated itself, sometimes violently. The list draws out the emotional housework of lesbian life um, how the emotional housework of lesbian life falls variantly across different social and material positions inhabited by members of the group and lesbian women more generally. Given that economic means was fundamentally important for basic lesbian self-expression and life, 
life away from the heteronormative family form and a family wage. Wages due argued that for wages that for wa wages due argued for wages for lesbian emotional work uh, that would provide lesbian women, women quote the economic power to afford sexual choices to come out in the millions end quote. So here we've got a concrete material analysis of this labour undertaken to sustain lesbian lives in Thatcher Britain. Um, yeah, that's the bit that's repeated. Okay. Uh, the London Group produced, also produced a detailed analysis of the social and economic impact of Section 28 of the UK's Local Government Act in 1988 that uh, banned the promotion, uh, that banned the promotion um, of the of quote the acceptability of homosexuality as a pretend family relationship end quote and that's the text of this of the law um, in schools so this was banned in schools and they theorised the wider implications of the law for diverse lesbian women alongside Thatcher's disinvestment in the working class they argued that section 28 would quote increase lesbian mothers unwaged emotional housework uh, end quote and the quote constant suspicion and scrutiny end quote lesbian mothers faced uh, that it would put straight strain on parental relationships, increased neighbourhood surveillance and policing, and potentially force gay and lesbian groups and subcultural spaces to close from economic pressures. Okay, so to conclude, thus to queer social reproduction is to expand the concept, to include the caring and sexual labour that enables the reproduction of queer and trans bodies and lives on a daily basis, and to count the emotional work of our survival within white hetero and cisnormative, able, patriarchal, cap neoliberal capitalist society, <coughs> both of which proliferate multiple and diverse forms of queer sexual, social and domestic life. Such work must be situated within the political economy of a racialised and gendered division of labour under capitalism, whereby the labour of feminised, racialised, migrant and disabled workers is devalued, and the effective labour necessary to our survival is often illegible or not recognisable. The devaluation of our work and lives is a historically specific and culturally specific phenomena relating to the world of racialised cap racialized capitalist society that we inhabit. The reproduction of queer lives and worlds has often taken place outside the family, within communal and subcultural spaces that have often remained marginal, emerging out of political necessity given the confines of the homophobic, racist, ableist nuclear family and the racialised and gendered division of labour that reproduces it. This is not to say queer and trans bodies, lives and monogamous familial forms are not dependent on or do not inhabit domestic space. Indeed, the familial forms we have been inhabiting and creating for decades are often rendered invisible as sites of social reproduction, as wages do lesbians argued, and only now are receiving very limited state recognition. We must account for the labour of queer and trans world making that buffers and supports survival in hetero and cisnormative patriarchal capitalist society through which our lives and desires may potentially flourish. To formulate socially reproductive labour from the queer and trans perspective forces us to consider the caring and effective labour that enables our being as trans and queer persons as valuable work. The loving and sexual pleasure, cooking and feeding and housing, rearing and resting, cleaning and washing and dressing, the emotional and psychological support, transition support, healthcare support, the work of creating our performative genders, the very fabrication of us that maintains queer and trans persons and our bodies, such that we can live or try to live and flourish when our lives are either not worthy within or marked for destruction by neoliberal capitalist or neo-fascist capitalist societies against the grain and flows of white, cis, heterosexual, able to normativity. Such work is the basis of our existence and potential to thrive. Such work can indeed be work of resistance and is creative work. It should be clear that effective labour is diff that uh, such uh, that that the effective labour that this effective labour that's what I should say. It should be clear that effective labour is different to the work that reproduces cis hetero persons operating with a different orientation, reproducing bodies and lives and our labour power that are slash is often marginal within capitalist society. Trans and queer social reproduction enables diverging desires and genders and bodies and sexualities and ways of being in the world. Our world is coded in excess of the socius of white supremacist capitalist society and its bourgeois nuclear family. The valuation of the, of the labour and social reproduction of trans women, trans femmes, queer women, non-binary and genderqueer people of colour, migrant or otherwise disabled or able-bodied is a radical notion in the context of the racial and gender division of labour under capitalism, where our labour is materially and socially devalued. 
which under, under which we are often poor, often overworked, or underpaid, or underemployed, or unemployed. That our labour, love, and caring, and the forms of community, sociality, and the worlds that are produced through such work, breaking out of and working against the expectations of race, gender, labour, and desire under neoliberal and white supremacist capitalist society, are important forms of work, despite their minimal exchange value, if they have one at all. Thanks.